Maxim, leader of the People's National Congress Reform. Leader of the People's National Congress Reform, Chairman of a Partnership for National Unity, and Presidential Candidate of the APNU AFC Coalition, Brigadier David Granger, Executive Members of the PNCR, APNU, and the AFC, Members of the Diplomatic Corps, Special Invitees, Ladies and Gentlemen, Boys and Girls. I am very pleased this evening and honored to have been asked to introduce Mrs. Supriya Singh Bowden, known to me as Auntie Supriya. She is a, a woman of grace and intelligence, and she is one of the women I consider to be a role model. I do not say this idly. Mrs. Supriya Singh Bowden has solid accomplishments in the field of design, business, public relations, international relations, and politics. You will therefore allow me to pass her career in brief review so that you will have a good idea as to the quality of person who will address you this evening. Mrs. Singh Bowden has an instructive background in international business and international interior design. Please note that she is not above sharing her experience and expertise with others. Through her company, Demerara Design Limited, she has trained many Guyanese men and women in her field. This very hotel in which we are situated has benefited from her artistic touch. A wing of the Pegasus Hotel was designed by her, as were many other business establishments, embassies, and official residences. Indeed, her international portfolio is extensive and includes projects in the Caribbean, USA, and Central America. People normally talk of the Renaissance man to refer to someone accomplished in many fields of endeavor. Well, Mrs. Supriya Singh Bowden is the Renaissance woman. You would have thought that she would have rested on her laurels. Not so at all. She is as qualified in politics and international relations, having acquired academic qualifications in both areas. She entered the world of politics at the invitation of Mr. Hugh Desmond Hoyt, about whom she will speak tonight. Together with a diverse group of enterprising persons, she helped to form the reform wing of the People's National Congress in order to redefine the party and make it more attractive to a changing and changed electorate. Later, she was to become a member of the Central Executive and Director of Public Communications. Let me pause to say here, what a woman. About 2006, Mrs. Supriya Singh Bowden decided to leave, to take a leave, sorry, from her political work to honor commitments overseas. But she never ceased thinking about her homeland. I have been told and I have every reason to believe that she responded positively and quickly to the request to be here in Guyana to deliver the sixth Desmond Hoyt commemorative lecture. But even while she was engaging in these activities overseas, Mrs. Supriya Singh Bowden found time to launch the Guyana Foundation, a nonprofit trust which has completed many projects in the area of youth empowerment, women's empowerment, care of the elderly, literacy, and small-scale community projects. By far the most outstanding project undertaken by the Foundation relates to its work with suicide among, relating to suicide among young people in Ghana. This has attracted attention nationally, regionally, and internationally. Allow me to say in conclusion that Mrs. Singh Bowden is fluent in Italian and is an avid farmer. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is my great pleasure to introduce this wonderful woman, an accomplished Guyanese. I now invite Mrs. Supriya Singh Bowden to address you.
Benita, you've grown into such a beautiful young lady. And I forgive you for not calling me Auntie Sapria tonight. Youth of Guyana. I start with Youth of Guyana, presidential candidate of the APNUAFC, Brigadier David Granger, leader of the Alliance for Change, Mr. Kamraj Ramjatan, prime ministerial candidate of the APNUAFC, Mr. Moses Nagamotu, executives of the PNCR, APNU, and the AFC, Distinguished members of the Diplomatic Corps, Ms. Gloria Hoyt, members of the Hoyt family, if you're here, special invitees, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, a very good evening to all of you. I'm deeply honored to be the first woman to deliver the Hugh Desmond Hoyt commemorative lecture. It is very heartwarming for me to see so many of you here gathered to remember and celebrate the life of this great son of Guyana. I would like to extend my personal and I'm sure our collective gratitude to Mr. Ronald Austin and his team for keeping this lecture series alive and well. It is an incredible contribution to our country's history. I'm also aware that Mr. Austin has arranged to record this lecture so that it can be transmitted via the internet and television with the hope that more of our young people will begin to draw inspiration from the life of Hugh Desmond Hoyt, an exceptional gentleman and statesman who contributed so much that is good to our country. Now I promise not to keep you too long in your seats, but please allow me to assist Mr. Austin in his endeavor by directing these few comments to the youth of Guyana. A large part of my work over the past two years has been centered around bringing national and international attention to the shocking state of mental health in Guyana. The findings of our researchers tells us that our young people, more than ever before, are under severe pressure. As a result of the necessity to survive, many families are scattered. The nurturing element that we gain through wholesome family life is now reduced to a dysfunctional set of arrangements in homes across Guyana. Our youth have no strong role models in their lives. These circumstances and more send many of them spiraling towards the ugliest end, and that is suicide. We live in an age where access to wireless devices is easy. Our youth live in real time. Almost every minute of the day, they're connected to these devices, tweeting, posting on Facebook, texting, blogging. And in many respects, they communicate faster. But at the end of the day, they've become a generation of onlookers, a generation that has begun to look outward for inspiration to shape their minds. They look to a world of progress, prosperity, and plenty. Unfortunately, the majority of them can never afford to participate in that world entirely. Through the internet, they find a temporary escape that eases their senses. They live hoping that they too can live fulfilled lives. The fact that our country has arrived at this juncture recording the highest rate of suicide in the world, would be for the man we're gathered here to remember tonight, the most crushing blow. Hugh Desmond Hoyt was a dedicated father. Sadly, he lost both of his children in a horrific car accident. He embraced the youth of Guyana as his own. He saw no color, 
He wanted to prepare the best ground that he could possibly prepare for the youth and the women of Guyana to take their rightful places and to develop our country in the process. I can almost hear the advice that he would give to the troubled youth of today. He would say, strive to be the best that you can be despite the difficulties that surround you. Have faith and never give up. Every one of your dreams that you manage to hold on to and realize will benefit you and in turn enrich Guyana. These were in fact the words that he said to me when I shared my concern with him in the late 90s, by which time the buoyancy in the economy that was present when he demitted office had already begun to disappear. As a young businesswoman, I was at a crossroads as to what to do. Mr. Hoyt was an inspiration and a mentor to many. Meeting him changed my life. In the parlance of youth, Mr. Hoyt was a super cool guy. He's not here to take a selfie and to tweet it to all the young people out there, but I will take it for him and ask the HDH committee to send it out with a message of one love, HDH. My topic, my topic tonight, ladies and gentlemen, has three components. Gender, racial inclusivity, and good governance. I will speak on these, but I need to establish the character of the man Hugh Desmond Hoyt so that everyone understands the depth of the man we're speaking about. As it was his character more than anything else that underpinned his remarkable achievements in each of these three areas. Mr. Hoyt was born in Georgetown on the 9th of March, 1929. He attended the St. Barnabas Anglican School, then went to Progress High School. He grew up in Charlotte Street, the son of Alfonso and Gladys Maria Hoyt. He grew up in a home in which the values of decency, courtesy, tidiness, honor, financial prudence, and truth were inculcated in him from a very, very early age. This had a lasting impact on the development of his personality and his character. After leaving school, he went to teach on the island of Grenada. In 1950, Mr. Hoyt passed the external examination and obtained a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of London. Later, he obtained an LLB degree from the same university and was called to the bar at the Honorable Society of the Middle Temple. Hoyt returned to Guyana in 1960 and entered private practice. In 1970, he was appointed QC, and when Guyana became a republic, he became a senior counsel. Hoyt's sharp mind, academic prowess, and his deep commitment to his country contributed to his election to the parliament and the People's National Congress between 1969 and 1984. Mr. Hoyt held many ministerial portfolios, including that of Home Affairs, Foreign Affairs, Public Works and Communications, Finance and Economic Development. He was Guyana's representative to the Inter-American Development Bank, spokesperson on sugar in the ACP. Mr. Hoyt was a member of the advisory board of the Women's Federation for World Peace and a patron of the Commonwealth Human Ecology Foundation based in London, among other things. In 1984, Mr. Hoyt became the first vice president of Guyana, then served as the president of Guyana from 1985 to 1992. Mr. Hoyt was an outstanding visionary president. He was highly principled and of impeccable character. He was a man of letters, well-versed in poetry and literature, and he also had a very, very fine appreciation for music. In a radio interview in Washington in the 1980s, when he was asked whether he would continue business as usual on assuming the presidency, he kind of smiled and chuckled and he said, 
I'm determined to be myself and to pursue my own style and my own way of dealing with government and people. And as I cover some of the areas in my presentation tonight, you will see clearly that he did just that. He dealt with the matters of government and people in a way that brought freshness and positive results for the country during his tenure and beyond. He demanded excellence from those around him. And those around him tried very hard to meet his expectations. To quote Sir Shrita Rampo, it was Desmond's absence of hunger for personal privacy that led to the 1992 general election and a democratic change of government. One that could not occur unless Desmond Boyd had acknowledged it himself before the election that he could live without being president. Diana owes him a monumental debt for establishing that democratic benchmark in the world. These few comments give you a sense of the man he was Hoyt. Let us turn to examine Desmond Hoyt's position as it relates to gender. Gender inclusion has always been an important element in the politics of his party, the PMT. Women have held some of the highest positions, such as chairmanship of the party and vice presidency of the country. There were several women in the cabinet, and several were also members of parliament. Some well-known names, and I see some of them here tonight, are Jane Phillips Gay, Winifred Gaskin, Stella Odiali, Dr. Faith Harding, Irvia Johnson, Yvonne Taylor Ben, or as I know her, as they want. Jean Persico, Rabia Nadi Khan, Viola Burden. And in more recent times, the work of the party continues with names like the name Deborah Baca, Amna Ali, an amazing woman. In fact, Mr. White's concern that women should play an important role in the politics of the nation ensured that three statutes of significance were enacted during his presidency. The Equal Rights Act of 1990, the Married Persons Property Amendment Act of 1990, and the Family Provision Act of the same year. All of these acts provided benefits for the neglected wife and the common law wife and he referred to them as his triad of social legislation. Mr. Hoyt's high regard for women was not a position that was calculated and manipulated for political results. It was a position that he deeply felt. Mr. Hoyt grew up with a very strong mother, and later he married a very strong lady, his beloved Joyce Hoyt. A lady to whom he delivered a single red rose every single Saturday morning. I hope you're all taking notes and you will all put your orders in at the forest to get flowers for your wives. Rickford Burke correctly summed up the character of Mrs. White when he wrote, She disliked divisive politics and conducted herself with exceptional humility, class, and dignity. She was very reclusive and private, but quietly yielded. Perhaps this is a good time to share my own experience with Mr. Hoyt as it relates to the importance of gender. I was working in this very building when I received a phone call inviting me to a breakfast meeting with Mr. Hoyt. I asked the caller who else would be in attendance and what was the agenda of the meeting. She told me Mr. Hoyt would be in attendance with one of his female MPs. 
and that I would be the only person in attendance, and she was not privy to the agenda. I paused for a while at that time, as the point was the leader of the opposition. I paused for a while, and then I said to her, please convey to Mr. Hoyt that I will attend the breakfast meeting. You know, I arrived at that meeting, which was at the Cara Lodge, the, what is now Cara Lodge, with the take room, the, the ballet room of Tate House. Mr. Hoyt immediately rose to his feet, pulled out my chair as a true gentleman should, and we began our conversation. And it was at that breakfast meeting that my life changed course. Mr. Hoyt shared his view with me that the well-being of the youth and the women of Guyana needed urgent attention and that every effort had to be made to invest in them fully and as soon as possible. Perhaps he foresaw the conditions that they are in today. He felt that he needed more people who could work seriously on youth and women's issues. He requested my assistance in this regard going forward. We talked frankly and honestly about the state of the country and covered much ground. And at that point, I learned from him that you will not only be held responsible for what you do, but you will also be held responsible for what you do not do. And so I promised to assist him because I too had become very worried about the future of our country as the late 1990s approached. My first assignment was to speak at a small village meeting in Golden Grove on the East Coast. I told Mr. Hoyt over the phone that I did not think I could deliver a political speech. He told me that he would assign Winston Murray to assist me. I spoke to Winston who basically said, Supriya, you can do this thing, you don't need me, and that was the end of the conversation. As I arrived at the place of the public meeting, ably escorted by Mr. Cad's can, I was as nervous as could be because what was supposed to be a very small gathering turned out to be thousands of people gathered in the Golden Grove Market Square. I was escorted to the stage and Mr. Raffle Trotman was at the podium totally in control of the crowd. I sat next to Mr. Hoyt and I said, Chief, I don't think I can do this. I'm just too nervous. He said in a very calming tone of voice. He said, Supriya, look at them, and he pointed to the crowd. He says, it's no longer about you. It's about them. And you need to give them a voice. By that time, a petite young lady jumped up on a box behind the podium and started announcing me with great fanfare. There was no turning back. And I give you two guesses who that person was. Deborah Baca. I made my speech to a crowd that became totally attentive. The die was cast. The rest is history. Hugh Desmond Hoyt respected my opinion. He gave me the encouragement and the strength to try to make a difference in my country. And I will forever be indebted to him for this priceless gift. Let me turn now to the policies of Desmond Hoyt with regard to racial inclusivity. Dr. Tyrone Ferguson, who delivered the first commemorative lecture on Hoyt, said it best, and so I will quote his words. He said, Mr. Hoyt was tremendously sensitive to the consequences of race-based politics. He thus practiced race-blind politics. Quoting Hoyt, he said, Guyana belongs to all of us who are citizens. To us of the People's National Congress, therefore, all the people of this country are equally important. To us, our fellow citizens, our Guyanese first and last. Whatever their ethnic, cultural, or religious background, in the national scheme of things, our diversity is merely an incidental matter which should be subsumed by our Guyaneseness 
as we seek to strengthen our society and secure the future of our nation. We will have the best chance of it and the best chance of success if we do it together as one people, and that is a Guyanese people. As President Hoyt sought to establish a meritocracy, that is, people working in his administration were always recruited on the basis of their ability and not for race or any other reason. Accordingly, 11 out of 18 of his ministers in the government were Indians. Bravian Ali Khan, Stella Odi Ali, Jailal Kasun, Daram Deo Saw, Kami Ramsarup, Gaukaran Sharma, Winston Murray, Mohammed Shahabuddin, Salahuddin, Ranji Chandi Singh, and Vibrat Parvatan, who I see in front of me. He was as good as his word, hence his nickname, Desmond Fassad. <laughs> Mr. Hoyt had witnessed the adverse effects of the intense racial divisions of the 1960s and its impact on race relations and the general development of our country. As a lawyer representing many clients affected by the riots of the 1960s, he had a front row seat to the spectacle of the wasting disease of racism. In what was to be his final speech to the PNC Congress in 2002, Mr. Hoyt fully endorsed the concept of shared governance, saying, our minds are not closed and have never been closed to new ideas. The reform group came into being under Mr. Hoyt's time as opposition leader. The reform being a group of civil society members, which included myself. The principal aim of the reform was to strengthen the democratic approaches to governance in Guyana. And we brought to the table the Guyana 21 plan, a macro infrastructure plan that has now been updated to the Guyana 2030 plan. In all of our discussions, deliberations, travels, policy considerations, and visioning exercises, Mr. Hoyt was colorblind. The reform membership consisted of all races in Guyana. Stanley Ming and Malcolm Choki, Chinese. Eric Phillips, African. Myself and Jerome Khan, Indian. And later, Dr. George Norton, Amerindian, and other persons of mixed race. It was Hoyt who appointed one of our incredibly talented heads of the armed forces, Major General Joseph Singh. He also appointed the first Indian Commissioner of Police, Balram, Rag Balram Ragabir. Mr. Hoyt was very, very, very conscious of our first peoples. You know, many scholars see Desmond Hoyt's role in the setting up of the Erokrama International Center for Rainforest Conservation and Development in the context of Guyana becoming a global player in the field of conservation. That it was, but for those of us who had a slightly deeper understanding of Mr. Hoyt, we knew that it was also about Amerindian livelihood and their equal role in Guyana's development. <laughs> the Umanayana was a strong symbolic structure that he felt put the presence of our first peoples in the rightful place at the center of Guyanese life and at the center of Guyana's capital city. He would often suggest to me that we hold important functions there so that our first peoples, if not in person, were symbolically a part of what we did in the interest of Guyana. And I would like to digress a little to say that it must be rebuilt as soon as possible.
The Guyana Prize for Literature was set up on the Poit's tenure. It was about nurturing writers, not of one race, but writers of all races. I could go on citing examples of racial inclusivity under Desmond Hoyt's tenure, but suffice it to say, this man was determined to deal with people and governance in his own way. His path had to be the morally correct path at all times. Racial inclusivity was at the heart of it. There were no sacred cows. He was heading full throttle to creating a racially united Guyana. He said in one of his speeches, change is as necessary a part of politics as it is of life. Those who do not change become dinosaurs, irrelevant and eventually extinct. If we do not adapt to new challenges, new circumstances, and new responsibilities, we cannot survive much less overcome, end of quote. I know that Mr. Hoyt is smiling in the great beyond, knowing that the leadership and the membership of his party have boldly embraced change in a very meaningful way. The Cummingsburg Accord signed on the 14th of February of this year heralded that it is a time for unity of our peoples and our parties. This lay at the heart of Mr. Hoyt's vision for Guyana. It was what Dr. Jagan, Walter Rodney, and so many of us want for our country. That moment in history has arrived, and it is now. Unity. Unity is now on everybody's lips. And anyone, anyone who speaks against this now will find it very hard to turn back the winds of change that are blowing across Guyana. The leaders and the members of these united opposition parties, the APNU AFC, they have listened, they have learned from their mentors and from Mr. Hoyt. They have put Guyana first. Let us move, to dis move on to discuss good governance as it applies to Hugh Desmond Hoyt. Where does one begin to discuss the policies of Hoyt in the area of good governance? Mr. Hoyt recognized that good governance in Guyana had to have a democratic foundation. History will bear witness to the giant of a man Desmond Hoyt was when he took on the wall of resistance from within his own party to move for electoral reform. Many of his detractors argue that it was the way of the world, that he had no choice. But I beg to differ. In 1990, fueled by the revolt against the voters list and the entire elections apparatus, the crisis came to a head towards the end of the negotiations between President Hoyt and the Patriotic Coalition for Democracy, mediated by the Carter Center. Hoyt changed his mind at the critical moment on the chairmanship and composition of the Elections Commission. Hoyt, in agreeing to do this, moved Guyana back within the comity of democratic nations. He stood very bravely and watched as his party lost the election, and they removed the presidential cacique crown of honor from his car's number plate. Mr. and Mrs. Hoyt, attended the swearing in ceremony of the new president. He appealed to the public to give the new president a chance at the helm. Now, this quintessential act of good governance saved Guyana from the slippery slope of ethnic unrest 
And for this, we are eternally thankful. The enormous decision to move to free and fair elections in 1992 is a major benchmark in Guyana's democratic path. This decision was made by a servant leader. His main interest then, as always, was his love of Guyana and the people of Guyana. During his presidency, Hoyt was a fearless reformer. His steps were bold and they were many. He removed restrictions on the importation of a whole host of household items. He granted permission for the establishment of independent print media and Stabrook News was born. He removed foreign currency controls which resulted in the liberalization of the economy and gave credence to the private sector as the main engine of growth. In exchange for these bold moves, the IMF sponsored the economic recovery program and Guyana's economy, economy literally took off with high growth rates and a significant num number of new investments. The ERP did reach all sectors of Guyanese communities, regardless of race, ethnicity, or political affiliation, and religious orientation. The conclusion of the World Bank report in 1992 is perhaps worth quoting. And that conclusion said, the, econom the economic recovery program aimed to eliminate distortions in commodity and factor markets, reduce the size of the public sector, and restore international economic relations. They said, few countries have moved so far, so fast. Over the next years, Hoyt significantly strengthened Guyana's democratic institutions. Possessing one of the sharpest legal minds, he knew that democracy had to be underpinned by the rule of law. And that began by example. Absolutely no executive lawlessness was allowed. In his mind, if the ladder was leaning on the right wall, if it was not leaning, he told me, on the right wall, every step you take would just get you to the wrong place faster. His was a no-nonsense approach to crime, and I'm sure you all know the nickname that he was given. Hang them high. <laughs> There are countless other examples during Hoyt's tenure in office that shout out that this man was only familiar with the building blocks of good governance. He played with no other. No other approach would fit with the high moral and ethical standards he had set for himself. As stated by Ian MacDonald in 1992, after the PNC had lost the election, Mr. MacDonald said, Hoyt fashioned a national ethos of discipline, inclusiveness, mutual respect, and harmonious coexistence of all peoples through his reform initiatives. He cultivated a free, open, orderly, cohesive, and progressive society. I would like to add, that it takes a very noble man to plant a seed for a tree that will someday give shade to people he may never meet. Tonight, I've tried to give you a glimpse of that man, a president of Guyana, a person, politicians on all sides, women, youth, and citizens of Guyana can learn something from him. I recall sitting on a dock in the Mazaruni River with Mr. Hoyt, waiting for Stanley Ming to bring the boat red, to get it ready for us to head back to Parika. There was a sense of quiet dignity in his demeanor, and what I thought was sadness on his face. We had just heard about the hard, harsh conditions being experienced by citizens in the river and settlements. And in that area, we were told 
How many young girls were forced to go into prostitution with minors to keep their families alive? The reality was bleak then as it is bleak today. I broke the silence as we sat there on that dock. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Hoyt, how do you stay so calm? It seems like we're fighting a losing battle to try to establish the type of country we all want to live in. How much more can these people take? I asked him impatiently and angrily. He stared out across the Mazaruni River. It was getting dark. And a very gentle smile came over his face and in that fatherly type tone, he said to me, the impatience and energy of youth will change Guyana. But it must be tempered with faith, Supriya. In political life, you have to have strong faith. And so we headed back to Parika. Let us fast forward a little now to Sunday morning on the 22nd of December, 2002. My security guard knocked at my door and he said, I heard that Mr. Hoyt died. I said, that, that, that is not possible. I called a few numbers to find out what was going on, but I got no response and so I got into my car and I drove to Mr. Hoyt's house. I asked his guard whether Mr. Hoyt was at home and he said yes. And I felt such a sense of relief. Sadly, as I reached the top of the stairs, I realized that Mr. Hoyt had indeed passed and was still in his home waiting to be moved. There were three of us there that day, Mrs. Hoyt and his very, very dear friend, Mr. Sais Narine was one of them. There were hundreds more that followed and I shall never, ever forget that day. I was asked to make all of the necessary arrangements for the funeral service for Mr. Hoyt at the Square of the Revolution and at the Parliament. My teams worked throughout the night. Guyanese of all races offered to assist me with fabric, flowers, and other supplies. I needed to prepare his funeral in a hurry. And at about 4 a.m. in the morning, after we had finished preparing the base where his casket would lie, I noticed a man attempting to sit on it. So I went over to him and I polit politely asked him, I was about to ask him to move. He was a homeless person from the Stabrook area. And he said to me, you know, he was like my father. He was all that I had. And so he stayed there until the sun came up. I sent out word that I wanted young people representing every race in Guyana to be part of the funeral ceremony. I wanted them dressed in costumes representing their various races, Afro-Guyanese families, Portuguese families, Indian families, Amerindian families, Chinese families, gladly provided me with all of the costumes that I asked for. They were so very, very proud to be part of this farewell. The task of the young people once dressed in costume was to symbolically release several white doves into the sky outside of the parliament building at the end of the service. An Indian gentleman from the West Coast gave me some white doves free of charge. When the doves were released, they circled back almost doing a sort of final flyby to the large crowds gathered there. The sadness and the grief was too much for his supporters to bear. They vented their pain on the streets of Georgetown and rocked the gates of the parliament building. While some elements condemned them and held up the usual ugly race card, I must admit that I felt the loss they were experiencing too. We had lost a man whose vision we hoped would take us all 
to a good place. I did what Mr. Hoyt told me to do on that stage in Golden Grove several years before. From the inside of those locked gates of the parliament buildings, I looked at the faces of the people on the outside of those locked gates, and I made a pact with myself that I would never stop speaking out until there were no gates separating us. I would continue to speak out until we arrive at a time when a smile would replace the anguish and the hardship being experienced by so many. A time when prejudice becomes a thing of the past and we would begin to build a future together. And the reason I agreed to be here tonight is because I believe I firmly believe that that time has come. And so as, as we reach out to find each other's hands at this time, however uncomfortable we feel, we cannot let go because we are nearly there. And so, I promise not to keep you too long in your seats. And so I will close with the words of a very, very wise man, Hugh Desmond Hoyt. And I read this to the children, and I hope you remember it when you grow up. Because by the time you grow up, we may be able to accomplish something of what I'm about to read. For too long, Mr. Hoyt said, our people have been bereft of happiness. The culmination of our efforts must be to return the smile to their faces, the spring to their steps, and the joy to their hearts. Ours must be the task to fashion a vibrant and wholesome society, at peace with itself and at peace with its neighbors. An economy that creates wealth, spurs development, and provides continually expanding conditions for all our people to live fulfilling lives. A state resting squarely on foundations of democracy and social justice, where within ever enlarging bounds of human freedom, the rule of law reigns unchallenged and supreme. I thank you very much. I certainly learned quite a lot about the measure of the man. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It, it brought to bear the thought of Ubuntu. Ubuntu is a Zulu word which means the spirit of humanity. I am because we are. No one man can rise above the condition of the masses. And that is the embodiment of the man we celebrate. I really thank you. My people are destroyed, not because they're black, not because they're East Indian, not because they're Amerindian. My people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. But knowledge of what? Is it political knowledge? Is it knowledge of maths and business? Knowledge of self? As a people, we do not know who we are. And for too long, Guyanese has been a trapped lion, potential unrealized. And for whose amusement? The cry today is that we emerge because the light is upon us. I always remember South Africa and Nelson Mandela, who said, a mantra away to power belongs to the people. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, 
you can say to this mountain, be moved. Our mustard seed today is our vote. As a nation, in our coming together, how do we maximize our potential? How do we maximize and manifest one people in one nation with one destiny? Dear land of Guyana, of rivers and plains, made rich by the sunshine and lush by the rains, set gem-like and fair between mountains and seas, your children salute you, dear land of the free. Even our, our national anthem speaks of freedom. But today, Guyana asks, what is freedom? And are we free? If we cannot define it, we cannot have it. But what is freedom? What is freedom? Freedom is not the ability to do what you want to do when you want to do it, to whom you want to do it, however you want to do it. Freedom is rather management and responsibility. The first resource we're given to manage is time. And time dictates agenda. For too long, we have had manipulators masquerading as leaders. You can be in a position of leadership but not know what leadership is. Leadership is not fame nor is it popularity. Leadership is a sense of responsibility. Leadership is service. And today, before I get carried away, we now have an interactive session.